faster the bus goes, the fewer buses that CTA has to put out, uh, and therefore there are obviously big operational savings there. And I just want to mention too that uh, like New York, I think we're really lucky with a very close working relationship between CTA and CDOT. Well, good evening. I'm Lynn Osman. I'm President and CEO of the Chicago Architecture Foundation, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to here tonight to this really wonderful program about this new initiative in Chicago, Bus Rapid Transit. And we're really excited that we have speakers from around the country joining us here on our program, Ticket to Ride. Cleveland, San Francisco, New York, and Chicago, we're all going to be talking about why this initiative is really good for our city. And for the Chicago Architecture Foundation, we really feel this is core to what our mission is, to inspire people to discover why design matters. And transportation is really part of that livable city. It's what makes a great city a global city. And it's something that we're really interested in here in the city of Chicago, and certainly at the Chicago Architecture Foundation. We want to make our communities accessible. We want to have transit accessible to all. We want to have spur economic development, which we saw in our trip to Mexico City, how bus rapid transit does spur quarters in the city. We also want to have well-designed neighborhoods, ones that we can be proud of, one that every citizen in Chicago can have access to the, all the neighborhoods of Chicago. We're thrilled to host this program, and we have some really significant partners that are here with us tonight. We have the Chicago Transit Authority, Chicago Department of Transportation, Metropolitan Planning Council, the Act Active Transportation Alliance, Civic Consulting Alliance, Urban Land Institute, and the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. I'd also like to especially thank the Rockefeller Foundation, who has really taken the initiative along with the Chicago Community Trust as sponsoring many of these events and bringing this initiative to Chicago. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Forrest Claypool, President of the Chicago Transit Authority, who will give us some opening remarks. Thank you, Lynn. It's a pleasure to be here. I um, particularly like to thank you and the Chicago Architecture Foundation for hosting this event. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation and the Chicago Community Trust, our civic partners, and our sister agency, uh, Chicago Department of Transit with Commissioner Klein and his staff. As many of you know, the CTA and CDOT are collaborating and aggressively pursuing opportunities to plan, design, and implement BRT in Chicago. And in doing so, a new mode of transportation is being introduced, which will be distinctly different, but complementary to the existing robust transit network uh, already enjoyed by those who travel around the city. Uh, by making the bus experience faster and more reliable, and by adding real-time information and other amenities, the BRT experience, we believe, will attract new riders and widen transit use by, by those who might be in their vehicles today. Bringing BRT to Chicago is part of the broad transportation agenda under the leadership of Mayor Manuel, who has repeatedly said that his goal is to bring a 21st century transportation system to a 21st century Chicago. In short, the, the city itself is experiencing a mobility revolution. From BRT to bike sharing, this is a city on the move, and we are making changes every day to help make the city more efficient, more affordable, and more sustainable. At the CTA, that means we're investing hundreds of millions of dollars in system upgrades and enhancements, new rail stations, new track, new rail cars and buses, and better communication and information technology for our customers, just to name a few. As you will see tonight and going forward, Chicago's BRT initiative is guided by strong agency and political leadership as well as strong civic support from community leaders who understand that transit investments are a vital component to make the more, city more livable and economically viable. Unique to the current approach is the, is the external collaboration. CDOT and the CTA are beneficiaries of support through other vested partners, such as those who were mentioned a moment ago, Chicago Architecture Foundation, Active Transportation Alliance, Metropolitan Planning Council, Chicago Community Trust, Rockefeller Foundation, Civic Consulting Alliance, and the Urban Land Institute, all partners in this enterprise and all collaborators with CDOT and CTA. These stakeholders have volunteered to provide technical assistance, contribute to the public awareness and educational campaign, and further the development of the BRT brand. Also critical to the success is support from the Federal Transit Administration, which has awarded CTA and CDOT a combined $40 million to date uh, to implement BRT in Chicago. In addition, we're fortunate to have strong support from the FTA regional office here in Chicago, who have been, a, a gr who have been great collaborators with us, not only in this project, but on everything we've done in, in my uh, tenure. Uh, 
Uh, Commissioner Klein is going to talk in more detail about Chicago's projects that are in the works, but our combined approach is to harness the excitement and resources of this mobility revolution and to implement viable projects that leverage the existing transit network. Our near-term BRT investments will establish a foundation for wider investments in the future. And this approach will ensure the continuation of cost-effective operating plan and capital investments that will be commensurate with, with ridership, land uses, and livability initiatives. Moreover, BRT will have a profound impact on the connectivity of the city. Currently, there are about one million rides a day on the CTA bus system, but these numbers are down significantly from historic levels due to increased road congestion, which has slowed bus speeds and created unpredictable and, frankly, more costly service delivery. BRT is designed to literally get our buses out of the congestion and remedy these long-term trends. BRT lines will also help create better intermodal connections between bus, rail, commuter rail, and inner city rail service to get people home, work, and play more efficiently. The Western Avenue potential BRT, which was mentioned in the presentation, uh, actually connects with all of our rail lines and would be a much more affordable uh, alternative to some of the uh, visions of the past, such as the rail connector system, or the circle, what was some, sometimes known by the, as the circle line. Given the financial challenges at the federal and state level, including a constrained CTA operating budget, implementing BRT service, uh, implementing BRT service on high demand bus corridor means it's an opportunity to grow ridership and service without substantially increasing the system's operating cost. In our approach, we recognize there is no one-size-fits-all BRT model. What works in one city, country, or state doesn't necessarily mean that it will work here. That's why I'm eager tonight to hear from our friends in New York, San Francisco, and Cleveland and learn more about how they right-size BRT for their communities. Because our goal is to get it right in Chicago in a way that's right for our city and our residents. Our goal with BRT is the same goal that we have with every other improvement we are making at the CTA, to deliver a better customer experience by providing faster and more reliable customer service to achieve Mayor Emanuel's goal of a 21st century transit system in Chicago. Thank you, and I look forward to this evening's events. Thank you, Forrest, um, and thank you all for coming this evening. My name is Peter Scosi. I'm Vice President at the Metropolitan Planning Council, one of the partners in tonight's event and some of the other BRT activities taking place around Chicago. I'll serve as your moderator this evening. Um, I'm going to do some extremely brief introductions of our speakers. You have uh, more full bios on your seat. Uh, and then each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes. We'll try and move that along quite quickly so we can get to an audience Q&A um, very shortly in relatively short order. Our first speaker this evening is Joe Calabrese. Joe is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the uh, Greater Cleveland RTA. He'll be talking about some of the work around uh, Euclid Avenue and the Health Line. Joe. Thank you. That was brief. Hey, thanks. It's my pleasure to be here to talk about what we've done in Cleveland in terms of BRT. And we don't call, we don't BRT bus rapid transit, but better rapid transit. Okay, that's me. Um, just for context, we have a pretty comprehensive multimodal system in Cleveland, pretty comprehensive bus routes that go pretty much everywhere. Uh, various buses, as you see here in the Cleveland area, from urban buses to park and ride buses and, and everything in between. Also, a very extensive rail system that dates back to the 19, whoa, dates back to the 1920s uh, that we call the Rapid. Very important that Rapid name. The Shaker Rapid built in the 1920s. The Red Line built in the 1950s. Uh, the newest extension on the rail line built in 1996 to connect downtown with some of the attractions on the waterfront: Brown Stadium, Rock Hall, Science Center, things such as that. Here to talk to you primarily about the newest Rapid, the Health Line on Euclid Avenue. Uh, Euclid Avenue uh, is, is the main street of Cleveland, kind of like the Park Avenue of New York or the Michigan Avenue of Cleveland, a very important street to us. Millionaires Row, as you can see, tremendous development, very public transit oriented throughout the years. Uh, but that stopped back in the 1950s when the streetcars disappeared. The number six bus line was put into effect, a great bus line, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, uh, significant service, but it did not attract the choice rider. Uh, that was really a, a, a concern. Alternative analysis will happen. Do we build subway, light rail? A trip to Curitiba by some of the business leaders came back and said, why don't we look at this thing called, called BRT? 
Um, regardless of the mode, we knew what we wanted to do, we wanted to care about 30,000 people a day, we wanted that connectivity that Forrest talked about, we wanted FTA funding possibility. We're very interested in the cost, not just the capital cost to build it, but the operating cost as well. The reason this was one of the major projects of the region for many, many years was someone, uh, many people wanted the economic development spin-off of this to help you could have to come back to the grand old days you saw in that picture. Uh, we, we, we initiated the project. We called it Better Rapid Transit, a very high-scale rail-like bus rapid transit service. Um, some of the best characteristics of rail, the permanence, the image, the high service levels, and the characteristics of a bus system, a lower cost, and certainly the flexibility. Um, rail-like, 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 we're going to call it the silver line to coordinate with our blue line, green line, red line. Uh, my mantra was safe, simple, safe, fast, simple, safe, and first class. Um, uh, we have about a, a little over a nine-mile corridor. We reduced 108 bus stops to 36 stations. That was important. Reduced travel time from 40 minutes to 28. Much more than a public transit project. Building face to building face, curbs, sidewalks, lights, made it very pedestrian friendly, integrated bike lanes, landscaping, hardscape, 1,500 trees, public art, put a lot of things into the system. Again, much more than a public transit uh, uh, project. Um, this was at a time when BRT was kind of unheard of in North America. No one knew what it was going to look like or actually operate. We did a lot with pictures I'll show you tonight. This was a picture of Euclid Avenue, and our concept was to change this to this. Again, the transformation of this to this with a, cur with a, a median, exclusive lanes, rebuilt uh, sidewalks, curbs, landscaping, buried the overhead cables, trees, the whole thing. So that was kind of the concept. We were able to get the full funding grant agreement by the FTA in 2004. Uh, funding ended up, not how it started, ended up about a 50-50 project. Most, most, most uh, projects right now are 50% FTA. Uh, we had to do a lot of work to get, to get it in at that level, but we did. Uh, and one of the reasons why this is uh, the Euclid project is an international model and a model of many systems around the country is there's three different types of configurations on Euclid Avenue. This is Lower Euclid Avenue, again, some pictures. There's the station. This is, in, in rail vernacular, a center platform station that, that serves both inbound and outbound customers. The vehicles pull up on the side. They're 63 feet long. They have doors on both sides, again, like a center platform CTA station would. Um, uh, in the Midtown area, uh, here's the stations. Again, they're median stations. They're offset. There's an inbound and an outbound. They're in pairs. The vehicles pull up and board on the more traditional right side of the corridor. Uh, we've also, as you see here, integrated bike lanes into this section to connect the two major universities on the corridor. And then in the far eastern portion of this, we lose the exclusive bu uh, uh, bus lanes, which is really important to us. We lost it, could not do it based on configuration and roadway networks, but the vehicles pull over to the curbside, operate like a normal bus would, but in, with a lot of the same amenities you, you saw. Uh, speed, speed, speed. Uh, Forrest talked about speed. A couple of ways we, we generated higher speeds. The vehicles are in their exclusive lane. They're high, there's a 35 mile an hour speed limit in our lane versus 25 miles an hour for the cars adjacent to that. The traffic school prioritization, when they stop, they stop less. I mentioned we reduce the number of stops. They shop for, stop for a shorter duration. Precision docking, level boarding, and the off-board fare collection. It's very high frequency rail-like service, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, peak service every five minutes. And one of the important things is the vehicles we developed because that vehicle wasn't on the market. We developed a vehicle that we call, not a bus, a rapid transit vehicle that's much more rail-like. We, we refer to this as a train on rubber tires and use a lot of the latest technology. You can see here some of the signal heads for the, the signal prioritization system, the level boarding system we use. It's very quick, easy, on and off. Off-board fare collection, our transit police do the fare, the fare validation process, which works very well for us, which not only assures people pay, but adds a level of security and safety to our customers on the vehicles, real-time information, call boxes, cameras at the stations, cameras in the vehicles. Uh, two of the major issues that we spend a lot of time looking at is the stations and the vehicles. Other than that, really, it was going to look, look like a city Department of Transportation project. So we did a lot of work, a lot of public outreach on the stations, wanted them simple, wanted them maintainable, wanted them substantial, but not take away from some of the architecture in the city. The same thing with the vehicle, could not find a vehicle, as I mentioned. We worked with the manufacturer to develop a vehicle, spent a couple million dollars in design development cost, 
to really develop a vehicle that's more like a rail vehicle, hybrid electric propulsion, five doors, 63 foot long, that's now available to the, to the industry. I mentioned a lot of public art and landscaping along with that. How do we market it? We spent a lot of time branding the system. It's not a bus, it's not a train, it's the future. Um, we really promoted the economic development uh, attributes of the system. Um, and ec economic development, surely, as I mentioned, was a big piece. This might be not the prettiest, maybe the most important slide in my presentation. It's not what we did. Economic development success was achieved through others leveraging what we did. There were people who really wanted to see their businesses, their property advance, so they took advantage of our investment and made other investments as well. Uh, unlike Chicago, we have a newspaper that sometimes is critical of what we do. So we were, <laughs> we, we, we were promoting that uh, as part of the New Starts process, we have to keep, had to keep track of our economic development. And we said, we're generating 2.5 million in economic development. And one day, one of the senior reporters came in and said, we don't believe your numbers. We're doing our own research. And they did, and two weeks later, this was the front page of the Sunday paper. Two great things about this. They said, we knew you were wrong. It's 4.3 billion, not 2.5 billion. I said, great, I'll use your number. But, but look at the title. You know, we, we're all familiar with sometimes the headline writers kill us, but the rebirth. Could anything be better in terms of economic development than calling our project the rebirth? Um, you heard from me. I want you to hear from a couple very quick uh, people who are experts in the field or economic development director in Cleveland. Well, when developers come with us and they're riding on that health line, the first thing they say is, wow, when they ride on that health line, they see all the things that we have going as far as development's concerned, and people are just flabbergasted. We have so many people wanting to come here and ask, how are we doing it? And I will tell you, the diamond in the tiara is the health line and all of the development along the health line. Without the health line, we never would have uh, made the investment into this area. Once the health line was under construction, we were completely committed that we knew that this was going to be a good investment, and it's been great. Uh, it's been great for a couple reasons. One is that the uh, tenants use the health line. Uh, the, the second part is the reinvestment, and that, that leap, of, leap of faith by the city and RTA to invest in Euclid Avenue. Uh, it's made a huge difference. Not everyone was sold on the system. We had one very brilliant downtown developer who said, I love what you're doing, but can you just eliminate the public transit part of this and put in more parking? I said, <laughs> this is a true story. I said, this is being funded by the, public, by the Federal Transit Administration. If there's a Federal Parking Administration, go find some money. The next comment was, oh, now I understand why you have to have the vehicle on Euclid Avenue, but does it have to stop? Okay. <laughs> I think Cleveland is, in fact, a model for uh, other communities that are working on uh, urban development uh, in many, many ways. Uh, transit is actually a really critical part of that. Uh, we're experiencing transit-oriented development uh, in all kinds of areas of the city, downtown, obviously, with East 4th Street and the potential for Public Square and, and those conversions, but also in University Circle. Uh, with the new stations for the red line and leveraging the health, uh, the health line, uh, we're seeing all kinds of transit-oriented development happening in the circle right now. Uh, this is Ari's downtown development that he talked about. He was worried about us ruining this, and, and this is developed. This is a copy. This is a picture of the development he's just completing right now on the other end, the University Circle end, across from the new museum, across from the new Marriott Hotel. Um, we were very conscious in trying to build that very upscale rail-like brand, and did it to the extent that, to the best of our knowledge, it was the first transit system in the nation to sell its, its naming rights. And we sold it to the two largest employers on Euclid Avenue, which were also the two largest employers in Cleveland. They're actually the third and fourth largest, the second and third largest employer in the state. Walmart is a larger employer, but they don't pay as well. Um, again, the Silver Line became the Health Line. We said, uh, that's OK. We'll take your money for 25 years. Pumping new life into the city was kind of our model, which really made sense in what we're doing. Um, ridership has been off the charts. Uh, the vehicle, the station, the landscaping all kind of fit in together. It worked well. People are using it. It's been highly recognized, as I said before. And I'll answer questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe, and all under in 10 minutes. Um, I had a chance to drive the, uh, ride the Health Line, not drive, uh, a little bit earlier this year. 
And one thing that struck me, I was on a tour, so we didn't actually stop for uh, fare paying passengers. But because of the signal preemption, the only spot we stopped was where we switched. There, your time is up. See, I told you you were, you were good. <laughs> you had another 30 seconds. Um, the only time we stopped was when we transferred from the median lanes over to the curb lanes. So it's, it was quite incredible, a very quick trip on the entire nine miles. Next, we're going to hear from uh, Ted Arose, the Director of Long Range Planning for New York MTA. Ted? Very similar setup in New York as in Chicago. Uh, New York City Transit runs the buses and subways. And New York City DOT operates the streets, the signals, and um, a ferry or two. Uh, and throughout, uh, there was an excellent partnership both at the executive level and at the staff level where it, you know, b both agencies really worked together as a client team to get these projects implemented. Uh, we started out, we did a citywide screening to identify uh, the most appropriate corridors for bus rapid transit. And we looked at all streets that had over 10,000 bus riders. And we did essentially three stages of screening, looking at both streets that had a lot of bus customers, but also streets that had the opportunity to make some bus priority improvements. And as is often the case in New York City, we picked one in each borough. Uh, we implemented uh, Fordham Road in 2008. It, it proved very successful. That built uh, uh, impetus and excitement for our second one, which is on First and Second Avenue. And uh, that's what I'll sort of focus on today. Uh, it's a very uh, robust transit corridor. You can look at the numbers. Uh, over 50,000 daily riders and over half a million people live within a quarter mile. The parallel subway line is several blocks away and it is at capacity uh, during peak hours. Um, to, one needs to know what the problems are that one is solving. And we did some very uh, detailed rides on buses. And what we found, and this is kind of startling, uh, that the buses are only moving about half the time. And these were the limited stop buses on First and Second Avenue, pretty decently flowing arterial streets. The remainder of the time, the buses are either stopped at red lights or, or boarding and alighting passengers. So our goal was really to make the whole circle smaller, but to certainly reduced the amount of time that the bus was stopped. Um, this is the picture that speaks a thousand words. Um, this is First Avenue as it looks today. Um, on the far left, you see a bike lane uh, protected from mixed traffic by a line of parking. Uh, three moving lanes, uh, a bus lane, one lane away from the curb, and then on the right curb, uh, you, you know, that you can have curb uses. We don't have alleys in New York, so deliveries, uh, dropping off grandma, the Snapple truck, whatever, can have access to the curb while the bus moves more or less unimpeded uh, one lane away from the curb. And coming back to the bus lanes, um, red paint, overhead highway type signs, the offset lanes are in effect 24-7, where traffic conditions didn't permit an offset lane and a curb lane was employed. Uh, you can see the hours, uh, extended peak hours, with commercial loading windows midday. Uh, just sort of a photo log. You can see the uh, various elements in play. Um, we were rather startled that the state legislature gave the city and the MTA permission to do video enforcement of, of bus lanes. We're not really sure why that happened, but um, it's wonderful. And uh, thousands of tickets are being issued. Now, you're, n you're, you're not hearing about it at cocktail parties. You know, we haven't started hearing, you know, a friend of mine got a ticket. But um, a lot of them are being written, and uh, people are finding out about it. Um, we piloted off-board fare collection on this route. Uh, it was taken as a point of uh, fact that you couldn't do this in New York. Uh, 
but we have the same kind of machines in, in New York and Chicago. This is uh, a machine that instead of dispensing Metro cards, it debits Metro cards. It works as a bus fare box. A receipt is issued as proof of payment for the customer, and then customers can board through all doors. Now, what happened? Um, bus ridership went up. That's good. Um, total corridor ridership went up, and you can see that uh, beforehand you had roughly equal people riding the local and the limited bus, and you see that clearly people have shifted to the new SBS in large numbers, but in the total corridor we're getting 5,000 more trips a day. This, in the environment where Manhattan bus ridership as a whole is dropping rather substantially. You can see year-to-date numbers. Manhattan ridership is dropping about 5%, and the SBS is, is up 10. So you might see that as a 15% growth if, you know, in market share. Um, what happened in travel time? Um, time in motion dropped by about five minutes. Time spent at dwell time dropped six, seven minutes, and that's obviously off-board fare collection. And time spent at traffic lights didn't change at all, and that's because we haven't implemented traffic signal priority yet. But we will this year. Um, what happened to traffic? Not much. Uh, if you look before and after some locations, traffic is moving a mile or two an hour faster. At other locations, it might be moving a mile or two an hour slower. But clearly, there was no uh, apocalypse. And uh, traffic's moving fine and, and not much different than, than it was before. Um, we had a, well, I guess the first, the first bullet is sort of the key there that good, good street design can accommodate more users in the street than bad street design or, or, or street neglect. Um, and uh, we brought in stakeholders early and often. We formed an advisory committee for each corridor, got members of the community boards, hospitals, universities, uh, and anyone who uh, was interested in a big way uh, to come to the meetings, and we hashed out a lot of the issues at the community advisory committee meetings. And then we might go to a community board later on, and, and the rep from that community board, when someone would ask a question, the rep would say, look, yeah, we worked that out, and we're going to do it this way, so that we didn't have to say that. So some, it, it worked quite well, and obviously building support from the business community is, is critical, especially if... Uh, you know, you're, you're getting into parking. Um, uh, we were able to show the businesses that their customers weren't coming by car. And uh, the key was really to make sure that they could get their deliveries in an unimpeded manner. Um, lessons learned, you know, for us, having a quick implementation and having a, a quick success was very important because that built uh, interest and excitement for more, more robust projects that we're working on. So having, having a couple quick wins was, was really good. Uh, um, at launch, we had people from the office, both City DOT and New York City Transit, at every bus stop for several weeks, explaining to customers how the fare collection works, where the stops were and where the stops weren't anymore. And that was really vital to uh, having it be successful. And um, so, you know, we didn't really want to stop there. And w we did a second round of uh, BRT or SBS screening. And we looked at corridors where there was a large number of trips that were slower than reasonable people might think they should be, uh, places that were far, high density, far removed from the subway system. So um, we're implementing Highland Boulevard, that's uh, F in Staten Island, uh, Labor Day weekend. Uh, Nostrand Rogers is a new start. Uh, 
and uh, that'll be 2013. Uh, Webster Avenue has a, a, a lot of similarities uh, to Western or Ashland, and we're sort of in the same stage of, as planning as here. And we're working on a LaGuardia uh, SBS where, where there's no um, direct rapid transit to any of the airports in New York, uh, but uh, there's a automated rail link that connects the rapid transit system to Newark and JFK airports, but there's no such thing as at LaGuardia. So we're trying to create sort of a bus equivalent where you take rapid transit to the airport and you, uh, uh, to the, as close to the airport as you can, and then this dependable bus link. Uh, so I, I thank you, and um, I wish you all a... Uh, successful adventure moving forward with bus rapid transit. <laughs>
The next one is alternative three. And this one would have the buses running right where the median is today. We actually have them fully separated from cars. That's obviously one of the great advantages. Uh, but one of the disadvantages that any transit operator will tell you is that this has the buses boxed in. So if one of the uh, buses breaks down, they won't be able to pass each other. Uh, in addition, it requires removing every single tree on the median, which in San Francisco is uh, a cer certain bit of an implementation challenge. Uh, and it's also, there's a sewer underneath the center of the street there. So it's also a construction challenge uh, to have your buses right over the sewer. Anytime the Public Utilities Commission needs to get access to that sewer, you need to shut down your bus line. So finally, alternative four. Uh, this one is actually very similar to, um, actually Cleveland seems to have all of these alternatives uh, in, the, in the health line, but this one involves that left right door vehicle. Uh, not a challenge because Cleveland has done it, but the challenge for us is we actually have two different types of propulsion. This is a, another San Francisco specific and talking about right fitting your BRT. Um, we have a regular diesel hybrid motor coach uh, that runs on this as well as you can see those uh, trolley lines here, we actually have a bus that uses those. And that vehicle is not in existence yet in North America. And so that was also seen as a major procurement challenge to have two subfleets uh, with five door vehicles. So uh, we, did, we, did, we did a lot of analysis for the environmental document, uh, did a ton of outreach, and we basically found that we really do want to do one of the center alternatives. Anybody who is interested in BRT really recognizes very inherently that the center running alternatives will perform better. Uh, they get nearly twice the travel time and reliability benefit of that side running BRT, significantly more uh, ridership increase. Uh, when we went to the public, we got a nearly three to one response of people saying, please do one of the center running BRTs. So we put our heads together and said, how do we make center BRT work uh, in spite of these challenges? And what we came up with is something of a hybrid. Uh, what, what The way it works is the buses will be outside flanking the median, similar to alternative four. And then at station locations, they will transition to the middle, load and unload using standard right door vehicles, and then transition back to the outside. So you're able to preserve the median and reduce the sewer conflicts in basically all areas except the station locations. Uh, we can use our standard right side door vehicles. The buses can pass each other outside of the station locations and yet get protection at the actual station locations. So we saw this as a way to really get the best of, of all worlds. Um, so just some lessons learned. It was not easy getting to this. We obviously had to invent almost a new alternative from ones that we had studied just to get here. Um, the gold standard BRT is really hard to do, and it, it is something you're going to need to right size for the city, but it does provide sort of a way to guide your vision. Uh, there are a lot of challenges in getting the gold standard implemented. People will kind of erode from both sides. There'll be people saying, why don't you just build a light rail or why don't you just build a metro? And on the other side, people will be saying, do you really need to take the lane? Why can't you just do everything except that? And in most transit projects, particularly in San Francisco, there's a danger of what's known as scope creep, where your project uh, gets more and more projects piled on top of it. We sometimes call it the Velcro horse, where your project gallops down the street and people throw their projects on top of it until it becomes an enormous Christmas tree. BRT is actually the opposite. It actually has a danger of scope attrition, where it's hard to justify any of the features in and of themselves. Uh, they just add a little bit of increment. But when you combine them all together, you really get that new mode of transportation that has really been talked about a lot this evening. And it's something that if you really want to talk about doing full featured BRT, it really sort of has guided our vision. Um, in addition to that, um, we do need more proofs of concept. It's great to be up here seeing these. Um, a lot of people in San Francisco are skeptical, saying this is something that works in South America. So it's great to see this moving forward in Chicago. And uh, we hope that we can uh, join our partners here and implement this uh, soon. We're scheduled to be uh, into construction in 2014, 2015. Michael. Okay, our last speaker this evening is going to be Gabe Klein, Chicago's very own Commissioner of uh, Transportation, telling you a little bit about um, Chicago's BRT projects underway. Then we'll do um, some moderated Q&A. So thanks for sitting tight for one more presentation. Gabe. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I, I'll say that already this has been reassuring to me, <laughs> listening to everybody talk. Uh, because it seems like there are a lot of the same challenges out there regardless of the context, although Chicago, as Forrest said, is different. We want something that fits our context. Um, and some of the, so some of the challenges and opportunities, really, uh, we're experiencing the same things. We're a bit earlier on uh, than most of you. 
uh, but we're very excited. And some work was done before Forrest and I got here that we're able to capitalize on. And our new mayor uh, that we came in with, uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel, is very excited about BRT. He's a big believer in it and uh, wants to move forward in a big, bold way. Um, so first off, uh, what is our approach to BRT? I think some of this is pretty obvious in that we want to speed up the bus. Uh, fundamentally. Um, we have heavily traveled corridors that the buses slow down to sometimes four miles per hour and uh, I joke to people that I can walk faster than that. I can definitely bike faster than that uh, and you know the operational improvements that we can make also affect the the bottom line as well as of course getting more people to ride the bus. Um, we also have a goal to make uh, incremental improvements. This is something Forrest and I have talked quite a bit about particularly on Western Ave. Um, where we know there are particular pinch points, maybe five of the 20 miles there, and, and I'll show you a, a bit of that later. And so are there things we can do now that are what we would call forward compatible, that no matter what we do in the future, if we go for silver or gold standard BRT, that it'll fit in with what we're doing. Also, there's a big push in the city right now from the mayor down to implement complete streets, uh, bike facilities, wider sidewalks, um, uh, you name it. And so uh, as we look at BRT, it really fits into our strategy for complete streets. We're making sure that we're addressing all modes. Now in terms of short-term improvements, uh, we'll talk a bit about Jeffrey, which is going to allow us to test a lot of the uh, BRT treatments without it being full-fledged gold BRT. Um, we do have transit signal priority already uh, out there on Western Avenue, actually, in the city. And we are planning on implementing more of that, including on Jeffrey. Um, and uh, full BRT in the loop between Ogilvy and Michigan Ave. And we'll talk a bit about that project. But the long-term vision to tie it all together and develop a real citywide bus rapid transit plan. The nice thing also is that we can make uh, modular and incremental improvements as we have the funding to do so, in most cases. Unless FTA requires us to do more all at once, which is fine. Um, and then, obviously, we want to develop branded services, uh, the concept of the third mode. You know, we have the L, we've got the basic bus, and then bus rapid transit, and what will that look like from a marketing standpoint. So, uh, again, I don't uh, want to go into all of this. I think most of you know this, but um, a couple important points here. Over a quarter of Chicago households do not own cars. Um, uh, one thing that's important to remember is that a lot of different types of people ride the bus. And uh, Forrest and I were actually in talking to the mayor uh, recently, and it came up that, you know, particularly hourly workers that are riding the bus, it's very important for them to arrive on time to have a reliable mode of transportation. It's critical to holding a job. Often if you have an hourly job and you're late three times, you can lose your job. Um, so it's sort of a matter of social justice as well. Um, and overall, we want to improve the customer experience on the bus. We don't want it to be viewed as sort of that other mode, that rail is the, is the primary mode, uh, and then you have the bus if you have to take it. As I said, this allows more efficient use of capital dollars. Um, we can make uh, incremental improvements. And then, of course, there's uh, efficient operations in that um, the faster the bus goes, the fewer buses that CTA has to put out. Uh, and therefore, there are obviously big operational savings there. And I just want to mention, too, that uh, like New York, I think we're really lucky. We have a very close working relationship between CTA and CDOT. And I also want to thank Rockefeller, uh, as Forrest did, because without that, I don't think we could have um, partnered with our partners as much as we have with MPC and Active Trans and CAF uh, to do the extensive outreach that's really needed on a project like this, uh, as well as planning. So let's look at Jeffrey BRT. So this is Chicago's first route. And I think the most exciting part of this project is that it's going to happen this year. <laughs> That's, I mean, that is really key. Because as, as New York said, it's important to have some early, quick success. And this is going to allow us to do that, as well as to test um, rush hour bus lanes. So this is going to be. BRT light in that we'll have rush hour service uh, or rush hour bus only lanes from 67th to 83rd Street. We will have a TSP between 73rd and 84th Streets, which will be the, the longest section in Chicago. One bus queue jump 
at 84th Street and Jeffrey to give uh, priority to the bus at the intersection. Uh, enhanced CTA buses with unique branding as well as internal LED uh, bus tracker screens. And overall, a distinct look, feel, and experience uh, of riding the bus. Now here's the actual corridor. What you're not seeing is Lakeshore Drive, which will be you know, one big uh, jump from downtown to uh, 67th Street. Um, but what you do see here is significant major savings in uh, travel time, particularly from 67th to 83rd, uh, where uh, during the peak hours you're looking at almost 30% travel time savings. And then with uh, TSP and, and some of the other uh, uh, parts of the bus rapid transit, you're still seeing almost 10% savings uh, during non-peak hours. Now on to Central Loop BRT. Uh, this is one where we're really shooting for that gold standard. Uh, this is an interesting project and it's got a few different elements. And we do have a $25 million federal grant, urban circulator grant, that we have to obligate by September, Luann Hamilton. <laughs> uh, and we're all working very uh, uh, closely, CTA and CDOT, to make that happen and we're on schedule. Um, this combines a new transit center, a uh, bus transit center, which is right there. Uh, that's conceptual. It, it, it'll look uh, different from this. This is just south in the adjacent lot from Union Station. Um, CTA will be the primary user uh, of this, and I think it's going to give a nicer feel to getting on the bus, particularly for the uh, you know, tens of thousands of people that come through. We, we have more people coming to Union Station every day than Midway Airport. I forget the exact number, but it's like, it's 130,000? No? 40,000? More? Just more than Midway. More than Midway. We'll, we'll just stick with more than Midway. <laughs> Did I mention that I'm new to Chicago? It's only been a year. Um, this is going to be really, really exciting. It's going to have an underground PED connection to Union Station. Um, then you'll leave uh, Union Station and come down. Uh, we have Washington and Madison couplets. Uh, and this will be where the majority of the improvements are made. Dedicated bus lanes. Um, on Washington and Madison, a protected bike lane. I mean, this is a real complete street, if you will. And this is uh, the preferred alternative at this point, which is option two. Um, uh, this uh, allows a, a cyclist to have a protected area to ride, nice wide sidewalk, a uh, separate area for boarding and, and, and alighting, off bus fare, uh, flush with the bus, and a dedicated bus lane, which will be enforced, uh, we hope, in an automated fashion. I'm not going to say anything else about that. <laughs> um, traffic stats. If you can read this actually from right to left, pretend it's Hebrew, um, we've got 44% uh, of traffic in the corridor is uh, in vehicles, which is significant, I think, to, to note, because that means more than half, 56%, are pedestrians. So take 4% of the vehicle traffic is carrying 47% of the people, uh, which is... Very interesting. And it means we need, to be give, we need to give more right of way to people on the bus. It's sort of obvious. It's a pretty easy equation. Um, and you can look down at the daily volumes. You see we've got, like on Washington, for instance, 14,000 vehicles but 27,000 PEDs. A lot of those PEDs are people already taking transit, by the way. Um, the BRT improvements can improve overall bus travel times through the Central Loop Corridor by three to nine minutes. If you look at option two here, you've got a 7.5 minute uh, uh, decrease in travel time for the bus and only a 1.5 minute increase for the car. So when you look at all three, this becomes a pretty obvious choice, I think. Uh, Ashland and Western uh, Corridors, this is uh, our new project, uh, CTA is leading the efforts on this. We have a $1.6 million FTA bus livability alternatives analysis. So we're in the very early stages of looking at what this can be. This is a 21-mile linear corridor, uh, and we're looking at Western and Ashland. Uh, we're studying options for those near-term improvements that are forward compatible, and then we're also looking at, you know, what can we do to make this gold standard? What would the effect be on economic development in the corridor, so we're going to have to do a land use study as well. And as you can see here, uh, the right of way uh, ranges from you know 100 feet to 130 feet, 
so there are some, some definite differences. And so if you look at the different cross sections, you know, we're looking at configurations with possible center running versus curb running lanes uh, with various uh, parking configurations in various parts of the corridor. And something that's already come out of this, this is, that's been very interesting um, is that out of the 21 miles, there's really about, I think, 4.7 miles that has significant pinch points where the buses are really, really suffering. So we'd like to work with CTA on some, uh, some of those forward compatible improvements sooner. And then also when we look at Gold Center BRT, it'll be interesting to see if we need it for the entire corridor or for parts of the corridor. So that's already been uncovered. And uh, last, um, we are looking at uh, potential future projects. Um, people are already asking us, can you extend those treatments once you get to Michigan up to Navy Pier? Um, an east-west connection north of the river has been talked about and in the cards for a long time. And uh, a north-south route on the lakefront. So CTA is already leading an effort um, looking at uh, uh, an alternative analysis on the south side of Lakeshore Drive. And we're working on a, a large phase one on North Lakeshore Drive for reconstruction. So we're incorporating the bus improvements into that. And then we're looking at, and we have some funding already, for a system plan to evaluate other high priority uh, bus corridors, and ultimately with the idea of creating a network. Joe, you talked a lot about the development potential of bus rapid transit in Cleveland. You showed that you were wrong in estimating its value. That's a big, you're a big man to point out your, your mistakes. Um, $4.3 billion in Cleveland. Uh, Ted, in New York, have you seen the select bus service have any impact on redevelopment? Uh, Michael, is that something that you're anticipating or planning for um, in San Francisco? Could you comment a little bit uh, on the redevelopment potential of BRT? Take it away, Ted. Uh, we operated in largely fully built out corridors, though um, actually a graduate student sent me his master's thesis today, which I did not attempt to read on a Blackberry, but he was evaluating the, uh, the effect on residential land values of our first project, Fordham Road, so I'm sort of interested to see what he comes up with. But we've tried to leverage our, pro our projects with things where there's uh, a commitment, uh, 34th Street, which is very similar to the east-west connector in terms of function, um, it, uh, it serves Penn Station and uh, does CBD distribution. But uh, at the far west side of Manhattan, there's, there's going to be a, an enormous development. And so that 34th Street SBS is anticipating that development to provide the underlying support for it. And on uh, Webster Avenue, we're seeing simultaneous uh, rezonings and uh, investment at the south end and the north end of the corridor for which, you, you know, it's just going hand in glove with the BRT. So I can't point to clear projects that are, uh, you know, that resulted from the SBS program, but I can uh, clearly point to where development and SBS is going hand in hand. Thank you. Michael, any comments on that? Yeah, I think that we're having a, a similar experience in San Francisco. We are sort of at the center of the region in terms of infrastructure, and we have a very progressive regional agency, the MTC, uh, where we are uh, projecting that San Francisco really needs to grow in order to accommodate uh, really sustainable transportation in the region. and partly through uh, progressive transportation strategies like the BRT network, has already sort of spurred growth. And then there's been some that's been developing independent of that in this area. And we actually have an enormous hospital going in right at the intersection of our first two BRT lines. And part of the development agreement is that they have to help pay for the BRT because for their hospital workers to be able to get there on transit and not have every single one of them drive, they need to rely on good transportation, similar to what Gabe was saying earlier. If they can't rely on that transportation, then they're just going to drive every time, and the area simply cannot handle that kind of growth in traffic. Thank you. Um, one other just uh, report that's been floating around. Uh, there are copies out on the registration table. If you didn't pick one up on your way in, please pick one up on your way out. Um, this was an analysis of bus rapid transit routes in the city that Metropolitan Planning Council did. One of the uh, indices that we measured was to look at traffic impacts 
if this entire imaginary 10 route network were in implemented tomorrow, what might be the effects on traffic speed, on travel speed for cars in these corridors. The model that we used suggested that the average traffic travel speed would decrease by only one mile per hour. So just take that, uh, keep that in your head. Um, Ted, you talked about New York's. You did that analysis in New York after the select bus was in place. You saw minimal impacts on traffic uh, volumes or, or traffic speed. Um, before I get to the question, I just want to throw out another sort of concept here. Uh, Gabe showed that really buses, this whole, this whole equation, the pie chart equation that he walked us through, this is about moving people. And I would suggest to folks that we need to sort of reorient our mind a little bit around this equation. How many people are we moving through a corridor, not necessarily how many cars? Because as we go out and talk about BRT, that's certainly people's first reaction. Oh, how's that going to affect the cars? Are they going to go slower? How am I going to get down this street? Well, if you start actually counting the number of people moving down the street, we've seen through these various experiments that, or, or implementations, that BRT moves more people. So to the question, has um, uh, New York, or I'm sorry, Cleveland, have you looked at that analysis? Uh, Michael, are you factoring that into your, to your planning? Certainly, one of the criteria for us, and it was difficult, we're, we're, we're working with our mayor three mayors ago, uh, and, and obviously, <laughs> so it's, it's nothing to do with this project, obviously, but, but we knew we needed the exclusive lanes to, to achieve the I can't remember three mayors ago times. in Chicago. Uh, I don't think I was born. <laughs> our, our terms have not been quite as long in, in Cleveland, but um, we knew we needed the exclusive lanes and the signal preemption to achieve the travel, si travel time savings necessary to attract the riders to get the FDA money. So it was really the, the, end, the end of the game. And the, the political process is pretty simple. Do you want the project or not? You're going to have to give up something. And not a, lot, a whole lot of analysis was done. In the one area, the easternmost portion of the corridor, um, I did mention we lost our exclusive lane because there simply wasn't enough capacity on parallel streets. But again, Small portion, still works well. Uh, do we get a complaint every now and then that slowed down the, 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 the autos? Yes. What's my comment? If my comment on that, get on the vehicle. Get on the rev train. <laughs> Simple solution. Michael? Yeah, so uh, for those not very familiar with California process, we have a uh, very strong law called CEQA uh, where we have to disclose all environmental impacts for our project. So I actually have a thousand page document, much of which is dedicated to what the impacts are uh, for traffic. So we have to look very carefully, not just from an environmental standpoint, but really from a planning and salesmanship standpoint. So we actually looked at all kinds of intersections up and down the corridor. And we do find that in a similar way, we actually don't see a big reduction in, in travel time uh, or an increase in travel time for cars. In addition, the cars on Van Ness Avenue itself benefit from the transit signal priority. There's more green time given to that through movement. So that helps offset the taking of the lane. In addition, our buses actually clog one of the three lanes in each direction because they don't actually fully pull over when they stop. So we're not, we don't actually have three full lanes in each direction. So you talk about that and uh, really try and sell it that way. And I think people get that intuitively. But people who are never going to get on the bus and, and want to drive, it is a conversation that you need to sort of keep having. And that's where these proofs of concept, until it's really on the ground and they can see for themselves that there is no apocalypse, uh, it's really hard to get that going. So I think these early wins are a really good idea. Terrific. Thank you. Any other quick comments? Gabe. I just think that we have to dispel this myth out there that when you take one travel lane, travel lane away from cars, you know, everything is going to go sort of haywire. Uh, because you know, we saw it with the, the Kinsey bike lane that we put in where you know, people were, there were some people that were nervous that it was going to slow down traffic. But you have the same pinch points at the same places. You have the same stoplights. You have the same stop signs. And so often it's actually not based on logic. And what you see before and post is often almost no difference. And then the other thing is I think we have to stop assuming that nobody's going to get out of their car and get on the bus or get out of the car and get on a bike. Because if you're always assuming, I mean, these, you'll still show you know, often no change in travel time, even if uh, nobody gets out of their car. But the fact is that we want to move people from one mode to another. And I think we have to start assuming that. Good, thank you. All right, I'm going to turn it over to the audience, ask if you just raise your hand. Um, we'll come around with the microphone again. Please just uh, state a brief question, then pass the mic back. Thanks. Yes, uh, can you tell us 
uh, the uh, relative operating costs, particularly fuel, of rubber tire versus uh, iron wheel on iron rail. Uh, the, per, the per passenger mile, I guess, is what we're looking for. All right. <laughs> Next. <laughs> uh, let, let, me, let me answer your question. And operating costs are operating costs. The important thing for us is with a number six bus line on Euclid Avenue, I had to pay 28 bus drivers to drive up and down Euclid Avenue to provide service every eight minutes. Now I'm, I'm paying 16 bus operators to provide service every five minutes. So much, much lower operating costs. Forget the fuel. Fuel out the window. I'm comparing fuel between bus and rail, it costs me much more to move a train by electricity one mile than it takes a BRT vehicle, which are hybrid electric, to move that one mile. Extensive savings. Fuel as well, but the big saving is in labor cost. Can you, can you talk more about uh, coordinating the schedules between the BRT and other modes of public transportation? I think this was being talked about through these early implementation. We actually have a project in San Francisco known as the Transit Effectiveness Project. And it's basically, I somehow neglected to talk about it, but it's a bunch of our early wins, that it's a bunch of things like signal priorities and stop consolidations and things where you can really improve those uh, benefits early on. And then I think the idea is these are sort of the jewels in the crown of that rapid network system, that these are sort of your flagship transit routes. Uh, and we really want to brand the whole rapid network in San Francisco so you know that anytime you see that bus, anytime uh, you see those particular stations, you know that your bus is, is coming soon. Uh, your ride is likely to be much shorter than if you're on a local route. And uh, really trying to brand it as this new, new kind of service. But I think they really go hand in hand. And as long as you don't preclude the other, they can really uh, be coordinated very closely together and, and move in parallel. Any other? Please, Joe. If I can, just very quickly, you know, I think it's much more important when you're providing every 30 minute service or every hourly service to provide that connectivity. If you've got a vehicle every five minutes and another connecting with a train every eight minutes, the connectivity is there automatically. This is wonderful, by the way. Thank you very much for all coming here. And thank you. We had a nice day for you guys to enjoy yourself here. <laughs> um, I have a question. I maybe disagree with the commissioner. Um, we have two options. Option two uses two streets to go east-west downtown. Option three has one street. And I was sort of curious because I thought, before I heard the distinguished commissioner, that the Having, having the BRT on one street going back and forth was more efficient, had less conflicts, uh, reduced bus time more significantly than option two. And I'm just curious if you had any comments about using a single street versus two streets. And so Alan's referring specifically to the central area BRT. Right. I can. Well, he disagreed <laughs> with you. you could. <laughs> Alan Mellis, everybody. <laughs> You know, obviously, uh, if people can board and alight at the same place, it makes the transit system more coherent and, and simpler to use. But if you have a strong one-way network in, in a city, uh, people sort of get that already. And, um, uh, you know, in New York, you know, you know that if you're take the bus northbound on Madison, you're coming southbound on 5th, and uh, because the traffic is moving faster, the buses are moving faster. I find this very damned interesting. Uh, <laughs> censor the tape. I've got a bunch of questions that I'm just going to throw out here and see which fish comes up for the bait. One, I, I find no mention of the difficulties with BRT where you have uh, an accommodation for deliveries to the entities that have delivered, uh, have developed along your, your uh, routes that you're, you're pushing. Secondly, 
Uh, somebody said that uh, people do get uh, tickets for violating the rules along the BRT routes. Now, uh, it's uh, not easy to argue with the cops. My question is, who gets the money after you deduct for the cost of the administration and getting it out? Does half go to the police force? Does half go to the transit entity? And uh, how do you solve that one? The last one is, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, I'm taking and this notes, is for your worry, Chicago boys. Uh, the line that used to serve Navy Pier is still under the uh, merchandise mark there. Two lanes wide, you got a two lane bridge on the other end that's up in the air all the time. What happened to that idea to bring people from the central railroad stations over to the developing northeastern uh, business district in what is now known as Streeterville? Thank you. So maybe we can, uh, if you guys want to respond to the first two in tandem, the difficulties with deliveries and getting to curbside and com uh, combined with the enforcement issue and revenue splitting, sharing. Um, you know, we work very closely with the merchants to try and uh, accommodate deliveries. Uh, there's spur commercial parking on side streets, uh, intersecting side streets, and uh, obviously uh, I think merchants can and will work with regular delivery, the regular delivery people to move deliveries to hours when the curb is available for that use which actually saves people money because if you're doing it in off hours it, it's faster and easier to take deliveries but um, as far as the revenue from the tickets that's that's whatever it is in that city um, in New York it's a New York City traffic violation and the revenue goes to New York City uh, just quickly um, we work very closely again with the with the with the businesses uh, found alternative spot, spots for delivery. The biggest violators, U.S. Post Service, UPS, and FedEx. FedEx. Without a doubt, 90% of the time it's those three. We work with them very closely, and the money goes to the city. <laughs> <laughs> Working with UPS and FedEx is <laughs> tickling them. Uh, any other comments on enforcement, lane deliveries? Um, Gabe Forrest, want to comment on Carroll Avenue? Uh, John McCarran, the former uh, Tribune Urban Affairs writer, writes a uh, column about every couple of years as a guest now, <laughs> even though he's no longer there, and promoting, he's been promoting that idea for 20 years. Um, I, last time he wrote it, I sent it to my exemplary planning department. I uh, have not actually gotten a satisfactory response as to why it wouldn't work or would work, so we're still, all, we're still going to look at that. But uh, that's all I can say for tonight. Yeah, I mean, I look forward to the same. Uh, Thank you. I mean, I, I think if, if we do the system-wide plan, uh, which we are going to do, it's going to be part of what we look at. I don't know where the microphone went. Wave your hand if you got it. Oh, there you are. Please. Um, how many blocks are there typically between BRT stations? How many blocks are there? Or perhaps we could say how, how, what's the distance between yeah, BRT distance? stations? Gentlemen. I'll, I'll throw out. Uh, it depends. I, I don't know that any two are the same. You know, you look at some BRT stations, the steps may be a mile apart, like more like a rail station. Closer to downtown, closer to density, might be closer together. Uh, if that corridor has the BRT service and another local service as well, they tend to be more <coughs> farther apart. So I think it, the bottom line is it depends. Uh, our stations on Euclid Avenue are the only stops on Euclid Avenue, so they're probably a little closer together than the norm, probably a quarter mile apart. So it depends. It's, it's the negotiation process. It's working with the businesses. We have what might be the only in the world Sunday only stop to get a sign up by one of the pastors because he was concerned about the walk being too far on Sunday for some of his older parishioners. So he said, you want the Sunday stop to sign off? You've got the Sunday stop. It's probably never been used, but he signed <laughs> off on the, on the bus. So typical bus stops in Chicago now are about an eighth of a mile, sometimes even less. Cleveland's a quarter mile. We've seen half mile as kind of a promoted standard. It's 
to go basically two thirds of the stop. So there's right now 15 in each direction, so it's about every two blocks or 700 feet, so really close together. And we're moving to something like about 1,100 feet, 1,200 feet, so every three to four blocks. Uh, and even that is a challenge when you're consolidating stops if you don't have that, that local service. But it's always a balance for transit service planning of how do you maintain the accessibility and at the same time improve your reliability and, and travel speed. Great. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. I ride public transportation all the time. Matter of fact, I don't even own a car. I have never owned a car. And the thing that is of concern to me is that none of the proposals deal with the issue of connectiveness. Are you going to have isolated transportation systems? For example, I can take a plane from Chicago to London, and then from London travel all over Europe and get off finally 60 miles north of Munich in the <laughs> country without going outside. Without ever going out into the rain or into the snow. So how do we go from one system to the other? For example, in Chicago, if I get off at Ogilvy, how do I get to the blue line? How do I get to the red line? Which is far more important than a corridor uh, that goes about five or six miles down the street. Good, good question. Yeah, Connectivity. It's a great question. And if we didn't I'm sorry, it's a great question. It is a great I, question. I misspoke. <laughs> and, uh, it, we didn't cover it in the presentation, but uh, it's probably the most important part of what we do, particularly from our standpoint, where we, we want to link the bus with the rail for CTA, and we want to make sure that uh, 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 people have pedestrian connectivity, which is why at Union Station with the new bus center, we're going to have an underground uh, ped connection. Um, also, with all the new bike share stations, they'll be placed uh, very close to or at transit stops. Um, and so with everything that we do, our planning group uh, works with CTA on making sure that we are creating these multimodal hubs, um, even if they're virtual. Well, sometimes you may have to walk a block. I mean, I'm not going to deny that. And um, I don't think it's necessarily bad to have to walk a little bit more. Um, uh, we, we want it to be as convenient as possible for people. And that's why we're going to, you know, CTA is going to continue to have local bus service. Uh, you know, we're, we're not... Uh, saying anything about that, but for people who need to get rapidly to their job, for instance, uh, bus rapid transit provides a great option, and uh, that's not going to take away from all the local connectivity. And you know, bike share, for instance, is a great way to locally connect neighborhoods. Any other comments on connectivity? Where's our mic? Wave your hand. All the way in the back. Um, I have uh, two questions or issues that are connected. Uh, Forrest Claypool mentioned that um, the bus ridership is down over the years, and I would guess that's because the employment uh, situation has radically changed over the past 30 or 40 years, where now employment is largely out in the suburbs and is dispersed. Uh, so one question is, I, I don't see how the, the BRT is addressing that issue at all, of getting people out to the dispersed uh, employment centers in the suburbs. Secondly, when you're talking about uh, uh, Ashland or Western or Irving Park, which I'm familiar with, I would guess, maybe you've done a study, that largely the, the, the automobile traffic is trucks, uh, maybe commuters, others who are connecting to the interstates, 9094 and the Eisenhower, et cetera, that are going out to the suburbs. These are people who cannot take the bus, and no matter what you do, they're unable to get where they're going on the bus. And you're talking in those cor corridors of reducing the lane mileage, uh, you know, by half, as opposed to New York, where you're taking maybe one lane out of four out. Um, so I, I don't know where you guys got the, the figure of, of uh, one mile an hour reduction. I know on Irving Park Road, which I'm familiar with, when that gets narrowed from uh, one lane or two lanes in, in one direction to one lane, uh, the backups are horrendous. So I guess those two issues are, are related, the, the issue of employment in the, in the suburbs and uh, what good does it do to, in, it seems like there's a blinders focus here on how can we in, increase bus ridership, but what about the, 
congestion, pollution for the majority of the people who are still in their cars on these arterial streets. All the reasons that you outlined are exactly why we are doing this. So, and I'm going to script the numbers, so I'm not going to give them, but if you look at how many people come in on Metro every day to Union Station and then get off and need to get to their job, how many, does anybody know how many? Anyway, it's tens of thousands of people per day. This will allow them to get on a bus and save eight minutes getting to their job. Also, you have six other bus lines on this route that are all going to have increased speeds. But as um, they were saying in New York, when you're in a built environment, I can't build any more lanes for traffic. So there's nothing we can do about that. But what we can do is we can segregate the different modes because just taking away a lane, is that's not going to cause a problem. In fact, it can help by creating segregation between the cars, the buses, which are right now holding up all the cars because they're having to deal with cars in their lanes. They're going around them. And so you have so many operational inefficiencies because we're not doing this. And what this is going to do is clean it up, and the cars will move considerably faster. And if you look at where people are addressing uh, uh, multimodal issues this way, and I'll just use Washington, D.C. as an example where I came from, uh, motor vehicle registrations are flat or down, congestion is flat or down, and you have uh, employment actually going up, and you have uh, more people moving into the city. And so we have to get there. Uh, we, we just, in the last three weeks, we had three announcements where companies in the suburbs have moved downtown to the BRT corridor. Oh, and w one more thing, the, the traffic counts. I mean, that's all based on science. So we have, you know, people and machines out there actually counting the traffic. We do pretty intensive modeling with CTA. Um, so that's, I mean, those are pretty scientific numbers. Good. Uh, Again, I lost the microphone. Put my head down. Okay, now we are really all the way in the back. And then we've got yeah. some more up front when you're done back there. Yeah, back here. Uh, the Mexico City and Cleveland BRTs, if I got it right, are, have been privatized. What about Chicago, New York, and San Francisco? Do you plan at this moment to have them, or are you in New York? Uh, are they privately owned, uh, or will they be public utilities? Joe. Cleveland's is not privatized. Oh. Cleveland's is sponsored by we, the Cleveland. We, we, we have naming rights that produce some revenue for us, uh, but it, it's run by the, like the CTA would be in, uh, we're, our organization is a com combination of CTA and, 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 and Metro and PACE, but it's, it's a public organization. And I would only say that the bus service in Mexico City prior to the BRT was also privatized. It was multiple private entities competing. And really what the BRT did was almost to sort of rationalize that competition and sort of allocate it a little bit better. So it didn't really change the, the situation that much. And Any the other, other plans? And the other three cities? And New York is municipal operation and will continue. Yeah, and, I mean, San Francisco, yeah. Still be the, the SFMTA operating it. Um, there is, you know, we're building this high capacity pipe on Van Ness Avenue, and right now we have region, we have one regional operator, Golden Gate Transit, who's in there. We're talking about bringing in other regional operators. San Francisco also has this phenomenon of private shuttles uh, going down the, to the peninsula uh, for the, the, the tech services, and there's some talk of looking at, you know, hey, if they're a good partner, if they want to pay in to use some of the pipe, that's, that's also a possibility, but that's for down the road. Okay, <clears throat> this is for Gabe uh, and or Forrest. <clears throat> I was wondering if Clark Street was one of the routes you were considering uh, with its already existing retail, and there's been some discussion of that being a, kind of an ideal site for um, a new route. Not, not that no, no, not in the initial plans. It's a pretty narrow, uh, congested street with a lot of intense retail. I'd be surprised if that was on any, certainly on any, any early planning list. Um, Corridors like Western, I think, which is very wide, uh, over wide in places, and has a, a mix of um, areas where there's it's not as retail dependent or as uh, uh, residential dependent, uh, and which connects to rail stations and, and goes north to south is a is, is a much more likely uh, a, a rational target to start. Okay. Is there a question? Oh, all the way back. He's got his hand. Raise your hand high oh, on, the, on the aisle. Wave it. Hi. <laughs> I. I I have lived uh, 
well, not my entire life. I did l move away for college, but uh, along the Western Corridor uh, within about a half mile. And uh, the thing about Western is that it is a regional road that people use to get not just up and down Western to different places on Western, but to get uh, from Humboldt Park up to Andersonville, to get from uh, Albany Park down to the Medical District. And uh, the question that I have is how have you've been looking at how you can serve those people that would want to get out of their cars but currently have to take two, three transfers to get where they're going and there are a large number of people who are going along those routes. Uh, is that part of the planning at all, uh, what's commonly known as interlining? Thanks. I think that's exactly what the plan is. Um, and then uh, and also, as I indicated, it does have the advantage of, if you look at Western, it connects to every one of our rail lines which then does give people an opportunity to shoot in into the city from the, from the western edge. I would just add that some of the modeling that's been done to date on Western Avenue and the analyses that's been done really show that around the medical district is one of the largest boarding and alighting spots uh, within that corridor. Um, people are probably going there for jobs and staying there. Many are probably transferring to the pink or blue lines and going somewhere else. Um, similarly, Western Avenue, because of its connections to a lot of the other train lines, is actually a great way for folks to get to some of the suburban jobs out by O'Hare on the Blue Line, which um, now is a pretty difficult uh, commute if you live on the southwest side, for example. So a bus rapid transit on Western could connect again to the Blue, either the Eisenhower or the, or the Kennedy, and you could get out to some of those job corridors. So I think it's really, the modeling has shown that it will be used that way, um, and, and then that's part of the planning. Uh, for those routes. Um, I think we have time for maybe just a couple more, okay. two more. Um, I just had a quick question. Uh, you know how they have the seven day passes that work on CTA and PACE. Will there be like uh, any type of pass that you can use with BRT and CTA so that way you know you can like save on the cost or something like that or how would that work? Yeah, I'm sure it would be integrated within the existing fare, st fare structure and, um, and pass structure. I mean, the, there it's might be some differential obviously um, because of the unique nature of the service. But the intent is the same fare medium works on the BRT mm -hmm. as the bus and the train. It's yes. all the same. And yeah, uh, the proposals that you have sound fantastic. It's really interesting to hear bus rapid transit described as a uh, 21st, 21st century uh, mass transit solution when it seems like it's uh, largely leveraging mid 20th century technology. Why has it taken so long for this to catch on? That's a great question. I mean, I, why did the streetcars go away in the 50s? I mean, there's, there's some really interesting questions out there. I think one of the issues is that we, like, we've already gotten rid of the streetcars. We already have buses. Uh, we're in tight fiscal times. And we know we can make really high return, moderate cost to lower cost investments to give people a better quality of life and that we've seen this work in other places around the world. So I think that's sort of the, the quick answer, but over beer, you could talk for two hours, probably. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would also just like, like to add to that, you may be aware there's something we in the industry like to call a rail bias in this country, that people just, for whatever reason, like riding the train more than they like riding the bus. And so uh, that proof of concept thing I was talking about before, it's really hard to get people very excited about what they see as just a bus project. And that's why the, the branding that was done in Cleveland was brilliant. You really want to make it seem like a new mode of transportation in your city so that people can really get behind it and say, you know what, we're going to spend a little bit more. This is not just a glorified bus project. It's a new mode of transportation. It gets all the benefits of, of a train, but it's going to save you a lot of money. And hey, merchants, we're not going to be constructing on your street for 10 years. It's going to be a very quick implementation. And I think it's, it, you know, it's a big part of selling it. And, I think as things roll out, particularly in places like Chicago, I think it will catch on. Hi, um, my question. I'm sorry, who said trains are high tech? I mean, one of the big issues, trains came before buses, so I think the bus is the newer mode, but in too many, in, in too many segments of our society, I say bus is a four-letter word. That's why we don't use the term bus and bus rapid transit, but it's really integrating everything to the best of both worlds. It's, it's showing how a, a rubber-tired vehicle can operate more like a train, more like a modern vehicle. Carmen. Sorry. Hi, um, um, my question is more related to land use. There was a mention that 
um, bus rapid transit changes the values of the land along those corridors. And I was just wondering how it happened in the cities that already implemented it, and how are we doing it in Chicago? I'm very familiar with uh, Curitiba, where they use uh, the transfer of building rights to, um, to actually bring benefits to the city, to the public, in, train, in terms of green space, uh, and um, for example, also um, uh, taking care of the landmarks or buildings that are important to the city and transferring the, uh, the building rights of those landmarks to those corridors that perhaps can, can use it. And uh, then we have the uh, transit development corridors truly, truly happening. So I just, I'm just curious about how it happened in the cities in, in the U.S. and how we're doing it in Chicago. One example in Cleveland, in the Midtown area that really uh, was void of any major development, the landowners went to the city uh, to petition them to change the zoning for minimum, minimum, uh, minimum setbacks, reduce the parking requirements, minimum four stories, really to come up with a more transit-oriented zoning, higher density zoning plan to really leverage what we did that's working very well. Um, that's all the questions we're going to take tonight because I want to get everybody out of here by 8. But I want to give each of our panelists 30 seconds for any closing remarks you want to make, any advice from our out-of-towners for Chicago on the plans you've seen, uh, anything, any takeaways for Forrest or Gabe from them. Please, anyone jump in? So eloquent. So Gabe gets a minute. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's the first time I've ever been called eloquent. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> Uh, well, I'll just say that I think um, we're very excited, uh, Forrest and I and the mayor, uh, particularly the, the mayor, uh, about the BRT projects. And I think the overwhelming sort of show of support uh, from the community in terms of all the stakeholders and partners and the public at large has just been wonderful uh, and makes this a really exciting uh, series of projects for us. And I think we're going to learn a lot. And I believe that, uh, you know, post Jeffrey, when we start to, you know, really get into the system plan, We'll start to address a lot of the issues that were just brought up about what type of investments are, are we going to make, what's the financing plan, what's the zoning going to look like, you know, it, will there be up zoning, and all of that stuff. And I think there will be a lot more community involvement uh, with all of you. And, so, uh, and I just appreciate all of your uh, support and interaction. Uh, like I said, when I started, I'm, I'm really excited to see Chicago looking at BRT so seriously and, and getting it forward. I think the idea of these early wins is a, is a great strategy uh, and just keeping your vision for the network uh, so everything is compatible with it. And uh, that's something we've, we've learned a little bit from New York uh, and, and Chicago, for that matter, how to pilot things and really get people to buy into it as, as it develops. And I think that's a great strategy. I think what I can bring from New York is that uh, it ain't easy. Um, uh, you know, it sounds easy, uh, but it isn't, and uh, a lot like your father used to say, you know, you don't got the time to do it right, but you sure got the time to do it twice, and we, and I think, you know, we haven't had to do anything over, and I think it's because you know, we've been moving in a, in a, you know, what the advocates would say is a glacial pace and what other people would say is, is a way too fast pace. But, you know, we've taken the time to get the questions answered and, and implement solutions that work for all the users on the street. Um, I'll, I'll second that. It's, it's not easy. You, you think this is the hard process. Wait until you start construction. Uh, and, and, and reduce the lanes for that process. But it's really, you know, number one, congratulations. What a great group. What a great meeting. Um, I really want to congratulate you know, everyone for moving ahead of this. Uh, uh, but, but it's very doable. And most of the time I go out and talk about BRT, it's BRT or light rail, BRT or light rail. That's kind of the decision process people are making. And, and I get hit with the question, why didn't you stick to light rail? You know, why didn't you do light rail? I said, well, you know, we, had, we were trying to do what made sense for us, trying to do what was affordable. And if we had the attitude light rail or nothing, it would have been nothing. And we would have been back in, in the dark ages again. So take what your community allows you to do and push the envelope as much as you can. And, and I think it will be very successful. Finally, let's thank our panelists. Let's thank you for joining us this evening. And have a good night.